Good morning, church family. How is everyone doing this morning? Good. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so my name is Katie, and I'm so glad that I get to host with my friend this morning. Good morning, church family. My name is Nicole. So excited to be able to gather with you in person um, this morning. So we have these lovely Connect cards everywhere, and we want to stay connected with you, so make sure you fill those out and put them by the blue boxes by the exit, exits when you leave, because we love so much, and we love your faces, and we want to stay connected with you. Um, also, want to say good morning to the online people. If You can also fill out your online Connect card at mycclc.info slash connect. And for everyone here, we are doing communion today, so if you're online, make sure you get your elements ready so you can participate. So we had something amazing happen this past week. Last Sunday, we had a group of individuals gather out there in the parking lot at a moment of prayer and launching. Uh, we launched 10 individuals to Cottage Cove, Nashville, Tennessee. So we are excited to say that 10 of us left last Sunday and 10 of us returned safely yesterday at six o'clock last night. So we took 10 individuals. You'll see some of the photos um, on the screen behind us is just some of the things that we did there. Uh, we worked hard, we prayed hard, we laughed. Um, we were probably challenged at times. Um, we were able to get some teaching uh, from Brent we were able to serve those kids that you just saw in the photo um, as well. They do a summer program and we had the opportunity to teach them. So each group um, separated and they actually led these kids through a full intense Bible study and they were attentive. Um, they were kindergarten through seventh grade we had the chance to minister to. Um, and then we worked really hard. Like I said, they put up a swing set, they shoveled rocks, they, they did everything in 102 degree temperature. So they didn't get a lot of rest, but they did it. Uh, but Katie is gonna share a little bit about the mission trip experience. So it was a great experience, something that I will never forget. And I learned many valuable lessons. Um, one of the big things that stuck out to me was every morning we got a lesson from Mr. Brent and I learned a lot about like biblical knowledge that I didn't know about much before. So that is going to influence my future Bible study. Also the kids were being taught that through this whole summer, they were being taught how important it is to trust God. And they learned that through the story of Abraham and you know, it just, it really stuck with me how important it is to trust God and that he has a plan for you. Oh yes, so these kids gave it their all, blood, sweat, tears, um, so it's amazing. So if you see anyone with one of these shirts on, um, be sure to ask them how their missions trip experience was. Um, another exciting thing that we get to celebrate, church family, is we've been talking about the capital project um, here for the roof. And we're excited to celebrate through the obedience um, of God's people that we currently have 10,000 $750 towards our roof project. That is just so, so amazing. So we are still full speed ahead with the capital project. You can take a moment out in the lobby and see our little poster board, ask questions, there's information there. You can even see um, they're coloring a thermometer to our goal. So we're getting there. So together we're gonna be able to do this. So if you want to know more about what's going on in your church, go to myclc.info and find all the info you need and check out all the upcoming gatherings. All right, church family, let's continue our worshiping through sharing um, with the resources that God has given us. Uh, you can bring forth your sharing here at the altar in the balcony. Um, you can go to uh, myclc.info slash sharing um, and you can fill out one of the sharing envelopes. Now let's stand and worship together.
This is amazing grace that a holy, righteous, perfect God died for you and died for me. Let's think about how great he is. The all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit.
right, church family, remain standing as we read a little bit of God's word and we get ready to receive communion. For those of you that are serving communion today, would you please at this time go ahead and get yourself in place. Everything should be there for you, ready to go. Communion is a very important part of the church family. It's one of two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. And it's very important that we take this opportunity to just kind of pause and to think. Remember is what Jesus said. He said, remember, remember that this bread has been broken, uh, the broken representation of my body that's been broken for you. And this wine that, that you drink is a representation of my blood that was poured out for you. So it's important for us to remember why? Well, because we forget. Sometimes we just frankly forget. We forget, how, we get used to Jesus. Um, you've experienced this when it's just kind of a casual thing about your faith. You don't really think about the, the, the significance of uh, the price that was paid, this blood payment, blood atonement for your sin and for my sin. It's an opportunity for us to allow the Holy Spirit to search our heart and show us anything that is not okay with him anything displeasing then we deal with it right there we deal with it we search our hearts and we deal with it and we have a moment to come and remember the sacrifice that jesus gave for you and for me you don't have to be a member of this church family or any church family to participate in communion but there is one thing you need to be a part of the family of god if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of the way of Jesus, what are you doing it for? What are you remembering? It's better that you just not do it. No pressure, no pressure to conform to what anybody else is doing around you. The church family here loves the Lord and seeks to remember what he has done in our lives. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, we read, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this, eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and he said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Now I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to bless this time and to search our hearts. And as soon as I'm done praying, I'm going to invite you then to come to the outsides and receive the elements and then come inwards. You can stay here at the altar if you choose to pray or go directly back to your seat. Sometimes we can get a little congested, but hey, we're, we're a church family, right? We're a family. So all you have to do is ask them to move. Excuse me, can I get back to my seat? That's it, that's okay. This is, this is how we get along with one another. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to remember that we get to just sit here for a moment and think about, first of all, Lord, is there anything inside of me that is not pleasing to you? Is there anything that you need me to deal with right here and now? Lord, we ask you to reveal those things to us. If there's anything that we just need to simply go and handle, we know that you are asking for mercy, not sacrifices. And so if there's anything we need to go deal with, may we go do that. Otherwise, may we stay here and remember through these elements, the bread, the juice, in this moment together as a family. So God, we just ask you to bless these elements. May it truly be a comfort to our souls, to those of us who do truly earnestly seek to live at peace with you, and with our neighbors. May then it be truly a comfort to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You are welcome to come down to the outside of this time and receive communion. Old things have passed Stay the same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing. Shine on darkest night 
going to have a moment of prayer and hear from the word and let's keep fixing our eyes on Jesus this morning this morning I had the, the pleasure of working with Scotty he's going to read from scripture second Timothy all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. 
It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Let us pray. Okay. Lord, this morning we have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this week, for taking care of our mission team in Tennessee, uh, for bringing them home safely, Lord. Also, we want to thank you, Lord, for the young adults and uh, Tom Ellis, who took a team to Lakeside Camp this week and ministered to them. And a lot of these kids grew in their faith and are going closer to you, Lord. And Lord, this week, you did amazing work in Liberia. We had the request for the three wells, the emergency request for contamination in the water. And through giving and prayers, Lord, we were able to come up with those funds. And right now, these wells are being preparing to be dug in Liberia. So thank you for all of this this week, Lord. And please be with Pastor Gordon now as he uh, starts this new series and begins to teach us on how to study the Bible. We ask for all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Hearing a message with the church family on Sundays for spiritual sustenance can be like going to a restaurant for meals. It's all prepared for you and served to you by someone else. Though it can be enjoyable for someone else to do most of the work, a far better way to get your spiritual nourishment is to learn how to get the ingredients and prepare the meals for yourself. The old proverb says, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Over the next several weeks, you'll learn how to study the Bible on your own and apply it. How to really feast on the word and satisfy the deepest needs of your soul. Now, church family, let's get cooking. While I was in grade school, we played a really fun game. There was this giant parachute, and people would surround it. All the kids would surround the parachute, and they would grab an edge. And then on the count of three... They would go one, two, three, and lift up as high as they possibly can. And you'd have all this beautiful color, covering of color and excitement and kind of like inspiration all, because you're like, how is this happening? What is going on here? In some cases in the parachute game, you lift it up, somebody calls a color, they run across, trying not to run into each other. Other times they pick it up and they do what's called uh, getting, having a like doing a mushroom where they turn around and they push it down as far as they possibly can and they create this mushroom effect with, uh, with the parachute. Oh, it was so much fun. Sometimes it can be a little scary as I've actually seen little kids that weigh next to nothing uh, go to lift it and off the ground they went. <laughs> said, I will never do that again. That was the biggest disaster of my life. I can't believe anybody enjoys this. I anticipate that this series that we're walking into right now, Spiritual Cooking 101, is going to be a lot like the parachute game. There's going to be moments where you're going to lift up, we're going to all lift up together, and we're going to see this beautiful symphony of, of everything come together, and it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be enjoyable. You're going to say, hey, did you, did you know it says this? Did you know this is a promise? Did you know? And you're going to be excited, and you're going to be just filled up with what God has to share. But there's also going to be moments where you're going to go lift up, and someone's going to go right off the ground. And you're going to be like, what just happened? You're going to be terrified. I'll never open my Bible again. I'll never go in there again. Who can ever understand it? I anticipate that some of us will have both of those moments. And, and I'm excited to see what that's going to look like moving forward. Spiritual Cooking 101, 
between myself and Pastor Craig, we're going to share this privilege of being able to teach you what it means to prepare healthy spiritual meals for yourself and for other people to share. Something where you can actually do something at home where you dive into God's word. We're really going to talk about the basics. For instance, this is a Bible, and you should read it. It's a very popular book. Uh, so many people have one, case in point. Raise your hand if you have at least one copy of the Bible at home right now. Thank you. Raise your hand if you have at least two copies or more at home right now. Church people alike, along with even atheists, will have a copy of this book in their home. Interesting, is it not? Today we're going to walk through uh, Spiritual Cooking 101 as we begin, and we're going to talk about the whys. Why study God's Word? We're going to go through a list of whys. Why should I do that? You're also going to hear some things that are why nots. Not that I'm going to teach you why not to study God's Word, but reasons why people are trying to teach me on why they can't study God's Word. And of course, as you can see here laid out before you in this uh, beautiful display, that we're, there's going to be some tools you're going to need in order to be able to prepare healthy spiritual meals. The sermon title for today is Cooking with the Right Tools. Now, I don't have that on your notebook, but you can actually go to the top of your notes there under uh, Message Notes. July 30th, you can write just underneath there, if you choose, cooking with the right tools. We are taught by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us uh, to do what is right. It is so important for you and for me to become familiar with this book and to take our time. Just take your time. How many times have you told one of your, one of your kids, or maybe you were told many times, slow down, the food's not going anywhere. Slow down and take it in. Why do people tell you to slow down? Because your body's designed to take it in actually slowly. And so the way that this is spiritually speaking, take your time. Don't try to rush through it. There's nothing wrong with reading through the Bible in a year. I think it's a wonderful idea. But after one year of reading through the Bible, I want to ask, what did you learn? It's big, right? It's long. There's a lot of names in there that aren't used today. Great. And that's a fine thing. I think everybody should read through it cover to cover, no doubt. But to be able to take it in such a way where you actually feast on God's word is something totally different. The basics. This is a book that, that is comprised of 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books to make up a canonized book of 66 books. It was written by 40 different authors, 40, 40, 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. That's 1,500 years over this huge span. They, all these different individuals, these authors, lived in different places at different times with different cultures and different occupations and lifestyles. But the focus of what they were writing about was the same. That is remarkable that over such a long period of time of 1500 years all these authors had one resounding theme to reveal God's heart and will for mankind no other document in all of history can claim what the Bible claims God's word is full of different types of literature. Perhaps maybe you're a literature junkie. You just love to read and you're bringing stuff in in your mind and you're learning all the time with something. Maybe you like the different types of literature. In this book, there is poetic literature, there's narrative, there's didactic or moral literature. History, there really was a flood. 
It wasn't just a cute Bible story, you know, where the giraffes are sticking out of the ark and everybody's smiling. Doubt it! When that door closed, it was on, buddy. Read it. It's a great story. It's a history. There's history leadership, uh, literature, and there's interactive literature. It is, in fact, the best-selling and most widely distributed book ever. We just, we just proved a lot of that with how many do you have in your, in, your, in your home? Well, many of us have at least two or more, even those that may not even really buy into it. Since the year 1815, there's been more than 2.5 billion, somebody say billion, copies that have been sold. It has been translated into 2,233 different languages and dialects. Almost every home in America has a Bible. It's exciting to think about what God's doing through his written word. And yet I have to ask the question, who out there that across the nation that owns at least one is actually reading it. Now, in some cases, you know, you have the hardback books. Those are good to prop up tables and chairs. People will put it under there and go, well, nobody else is using it for anything. It's also a great decoration, huh? Put it on your table along with your crucifix and you say, I am such a good Christian. But who's opening it? Who's cracking the spine of it? Who's looking at it as something more than just a religious document that I have to read? Some 47% of Americans would say that the Bible is an important book to read. And yet, how many are actually reading? Oh yeah, I think you should totally read it. How often do you read it? Well, we say it's important. 47% of Americans say that it's important but the question remains, who's actually reading it? Through this series, I want you to know that you do not have to be afraid of this book. You don't have to be afraid of the Bible. I know some people might even go as far as to say, well, I've studied a lot of it. The first 65 books, I'm on board with. Love it. But that revelation, I mean, who can even enjoy, who can even enjoy that? There's no, there's no concept of mental map of what they're talking about. Everybody's arguing about it. Some church families are built upon the foundation of one book, Revelation. And so nobody wants to dive into it. They're afraid of it. And I'm willing to say that if it's in here, God probably wants me to cross over it. <laughs> he probably wants me to review it. And the reality is there's a lot that I just don't know in here. Oh my goodness, you have no idea how much I don't know. Every week I look at it and I go, oh, I wish I knew more. I'm just not one of those pastors that has the capacity, and, and I work really hard at it, somebody to say, hey, have you ever considered, oh yeah, that's found in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 3, which is quoted in this, this, and this, right? Three different translations, and then I just give a perfect, you know, translation of it. I'm not that guy. But yet God still has me in a place to teach this. So one thing he's taught me is a great amount of humility. And that's what we need. We need to have a great amount of humility when we go to approach the Word of God, knowing that we don't know it all. Oh, I've heard that. Yeah, but did you really feast on that? Did you really take it in for what God was trying to say to you? There's no need to be afraid of the Bible. Now, some people will give me some why nots of studying the Bible. Well, I don't know how, they'll say. Great, I got a solution for that. You just need a guide. These five weeks are a guide where you can use the message notebooks and you can go back through your own notes that you write down and kind of see for yourself what you're learning. You can go back through the archives and you can check for yourself and reread some of the stuff that's out there or rewatch. So we're going to scratch that off. We don't have to worry about it. I don't know how because we're going to teach you. I don't have time. Let's make sure that we are very clear on this phrase. I don't have time is actually not a good phrase. I, uh, I haven't taken time is a much more accurate 
phrase. When people say to me, hey, I've taken enough of your time, indicates that you robbed me of time. That's not a relationship. When, I, when people say that to me, I correct them um, very kindly. Actually, please know you didn't take anything from me. I chose to give you my time. Now that's relational. And so when it comes down to this time, what are you investing your time in? We all have the same 168 hours in a week. What you choose to take time to do is what you choose to take time to do. But don't say you don't have time. You just simply put that time in something else. What is a priority in your life? Matthew chapter 4 says that people don't live on bre by bread alone, by just physically eating, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If in fact you are a growing believer, you have to, or you would have already been studying this if you are in fact growing. I'm just a layman. I'm not a pastor. I didn't go to seminary. Me neither. What? We're learning from him? I didn't go to seminary. I went to undergraduate school, then I went to graduate school. My master's in pastoral theology, but I didn't go to seminary. I had to learn so much along the way, and God guided me. But you take away a title of pastor, and what's the difference between me and you? We're both believers trying to seek the heart of Jesus. And we need to know more about him, how we're supposed to behave, what's going on in the world, what, is, what has, what is, what's to come. And we can find that through this literature. I know you'll say, but I have my doubts about the Bible. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? In this day and age, when everybody just does what they feel, right? Well, I just, I just have my doubts. I say, take all your doubts and concerns and go at it. Go at it. Dive into God's word. Earnestly seeking Christ as you are trying to learn, as you are trying to go, believer. Concerns about the reliability of Scripture? Sure. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, there's a, there's a verse in there that if you can get past this verse, uh, the rest of it's reasonably easy. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the, you already know it. You know it. If you can believe that an all-knowing, all-powerful, righteous, holy, uh, just God can create something out of complete nothing, what is it for him to help you out with your needs? What is it for him to be able to walk you through difficult situations? Why would it then be hard to believe that that God put this together I can't seem to make it interesting I get it you probably have a translation or a version that you shouldn't it's possible that you're trying to understand something through the language that you don't speak it's possible it's possible I have I have a new living translation that I study with I also have a parallel New Living Translation in King James for the fun of it. And I go through and I read through it. I have had the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase. It's not a direct translation. I'm just trying to read through it and try to take it in. I recommend multiple different versions. You can find it at BibleGateway.com. You can, you can go to a Bible Hub, a blue, blue Letter Bible. You can find a variety of different things on there. I would stick to very certain websites. Don't just go on there. Just because, it's on web, just because it's online doesn't make it right. Let me say that again. Just because they were able to publish it doesn't make it God-honoring. So you talk to people, right? Talk to us. We'll help you. We'll guide you along and give you the tools that you need. So those are some of the why nots. Maybe you've said that. So what's a why behind it? Why should I care? Why should I study God's word? Well, let me explain it to you this way. Back in March of, uh, 15th of 2014, my sweet wife and I went to a Family Life Weekend to Remember Marriage Conference. Highly recommend getting away with your spouse, especially if you have little ones at home, because your time is their time, right? 
And so uh, we have this, we have this um, homework that at the, after the first session, I believe it was, that you go back to your room or go to uh, get coffee or sit somewhere and write a love letter to each other. And no, I'm not reading it to you. I have this now, nine years later, because I know the author. And she's so cool. And what I'll do is I'll go over this letter and I'll go, huh, I wonder if she still believes that. And then I'll wonder the punctuality, the, 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 the punctuation. I'll wonder the wording. Why did you use this versus that? And I'll just think through it. I've never said I had a clock where I set three minutes. And I say, I'm going to spend time here in this for three minutes if it's going to kill me, right? I've never paid attention to how much time I read it. I just sometimes will, I'll put it in my book bag or I have it in my Bible and I'll just come across it. And I'm like, ooh, a letter. <laughs> and I'll read through it again. And sometimes time will get away from me. Before you ever are going to embrace this book, you have to know the author. You read it as though you're reading a love letter where you read through it and you go, man, what did he mean by that? Oh, that happened? Wow, is God good. You read it to really feast on God's word, to be able to grasp it, to be able to learn it, praying through the whole time. God, show me this. Allowing the Holy Spirit to show you something you're missing. I've read stories that I learned growing up in, in Sunday school, and I go back through it and I go, they left that out, right? Because it's age appropriate. You know, when you talk about David and Bathsheba, David made a really bad choice when you're a kid. And then when you're an adult, you're like, he really screwed up, you know what I mean? David and Goliath, oh yeah, hit him with the stone. And then we just kind of leave it there. And then we learned here through that story as we walked through it again that it was a little more graphic, wasn't it? Sometimes it's age appropriate in which we're learning, in which we're growing. Even as a believer, if you're a baby Christian, take time and go age appropriately, little by little, and allow the Spirit to grow you. This is like reading a love letter, but it's not a hallmark love letter where everything's basically superficial and perfect and pretty. I assure you, there's a whole lot of not so pretty in here. But it's true. It's real. It is the living word of God. Some reasons why we should study God's word is that it's totally reliable and without error. 2 Timothy chapter 3, once again, as, as Scotty read this to us, all scripture is inspired by God. That means it's literally God-breathed, that word inspired means, and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It, it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. If you've ever sat down with the Bible and discovered you were in error and did not fix it, you just start trying to justify it. Well, there must be somewhere else in there that it says that I can do that. Well, maybe this verse. Well, I don't know. And then you just say, well, forget it. I'll just skip that one. I believe 99% of God's word. It's not how it works. You're either in or you're out. Verse, uh, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in the scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Since the Bible is the inspired word of God, presenting us with God's words through human language, it is fully intact as it was originally written as God chooses and fully reliable. You can trust this. I know some would say, well, it's not really like, you know, it's not up to date. It's not up to, it's, 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 I'm just trying to make it matter to my life right now. Well, it's interesting because God's nature doesn't change man's nature of sin doesn't change it's relevant it was relevant back then it's relevant today 
other holy books, um, holy books, uh, is a lot different than God's word. God's word actually says to test it. Other holy books won't do that. They're like, no, 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 just believe it. Just buy it. No, no, just stay there. Somebody wants to walk away from other groups or even cults, um, you are the, you're not so easily done. Yeah, it's not so easily done. There's a level of force and manipulation. If you choose to walk away from this, it will hurt your church family for the sake that this is a family. And when somebody is lost to the world, we pray over them. But we'll leave you to the Lord to let him handle it. If we've had our conversations, if we've had our confrontations, then we simply let you deal with the Lord on that. It actually, in, in Acts chapter 17, we read about how the, the Bereans uh, heard from the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul laid it out. You know he did. Here's the truth. And they, oh, that's great. We're going to time out. Yeah, we're going to check on that before we go further. And they went and researched and, and discovered that what was being taught was in fact true. My desire is that you will listen to a variety of teachings from a variety of pastors and your ear will be able to pick up, your discernment will be able to pick up. Something seems off there. And then you go and research it yourself. I need you to do that for me. I need you to not just come in here, be spoon fed and go home. I need you to come, learn, and go test it. Check it out. I've had conversations where people say, hey, you said this. I'm not sure I believe that. What was your thought behind that? Those are great conversations. I know you're like, well, that sounds confrontational. My whole life's confrontational as a believer. There's someone around just about every corner waiting for me to do something or say something they can hold on to. Maybe not so much for me because it's not like I'm something to be canceled. But there are people out there that are, that are saying like, hey, we should follow the Lord. And then they just try to cancel them. Things like that. You should always test what you're being told. First Thessalonians says that we are instructed to actually test. The King James says, prove all things. Prove it. Test it. Dive into it. Experience alone shows you that what we have believed for many years can in fact change within ourselves. So we need to put everything up to this. You pick up a book from the library, let's say, or you buy it online, read it, enjoy it. Always take any book and put the Bible over top of it and read it. And if it doesn't match up with God's word, then you drop it. This would be the ultimate authority in that. Because you would trust it. If you trust the, if you trust the author, the ultimate author, the Holy Spirit, then you can trust these words. As I said, God's, God's and mankind's nature do not change. The Bible is completely relevant. God's nature, according to Malachi 3.6, God affirms, I, the Lord, do not change. You can also see this in Numbers, 1 Samuel, Isaiah, Ezekiel. You can see so much how God is constant. But the nature of man is also and now I, know nothing, now I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't, Romans 7. Romans 3, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. The Holy Spirit starts the conversation and draws people. Then you have to make a decision at that point. We are not wise on our own. The only good that is in us is that of God. That's why we need to study God's word. And there's so much false teaching out there. Just because somebody dresses the part, is very charismatic and fun, doesn't make them reliable and accurate in God's word. What makes somebody reliable and accurate is if they teach it reliably and accurately. They don't have to be very... Uh, excitable. They just need to be speaking the truth. And you as a follower need to focus in on this and what you're being taught rather than just the presentation of it all. It's easier, no doubt, when somebody is trying to share it in a more of an exciting way. But nonetheless, the truth is the truth. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read how Paul describes people having itching ears. Whenever you have an itch, what do you need to do? Scratch it. The the questions are going to get much harder than this. Um, You scratch it. Oh, I've got an itch. You don't even think about it. You just go for it, right? If you ever had a a cast on your arm, right? And you know that sometimes you get one of those wire hangers and try to get it down in there to scratch that itch. Paul talks about how people have itching ears. And what they want to do is they want to have something that they enjoy scratch that itch. So if it's like, oh, if I give to the Lord, he guarantees I'll become rich. Oh, I like that. Whenever you see somebody doing this, they're probably closer to uh, your dog than a follower of Christ, right? (laughs) No offense, please. No emails. And so this is why we should study God's word. Because people are out there with itchy ears. And they're scratching it with a whole bunch of junk. You need to know the truth. You need to know the truth. The solution to this resides in proper discernment based on what God's word says. And it is my desire that you would recognize truth and follow it well. And finally, it helps us learn from others and equips us to serve God. We learn from King David. We saw how that turned out. You can learn. You actually can learn from other people's mistakes. This is why it's good for parents to talk to their children and children to listen to their parents. Because we have gone through things we would love for you to not to have to go through. Ultimately, you decide whether or not you're going to listen and you're going to heed the wisdom of others. Or whether or not you're just going to simply have to learn it all the hard way. Why study the Bible? Let's look at why David did. Open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. It has 176 verses. And no, we are not going to go through all 176 this morning. I encourage you to go through it yourself. You go to Psalm 119. You may have seen this before, but you weren't really sure what you were looking at. Psalm 119 is a beautiful, alphabetic, acrostic psalm that is written using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. 22 stanzas with 8 lines or verses each. They go through the Hebrew alphabet. It starts with the first five here. Uh, Aleph, Bet, Kimel, uh, Gimel, Dalet, and Hey. That's what, how you pronounce it. The fifth letter in the alphabet, Jimmy, is Hey. I just thought that was fun. See, it can be so fun when you learn these things. I do not have these all memorized, nor can I recite these um, on demand. I am learning right alongside you. Sometimes I retain it, and sometimes I don't. Psalm 119, uh, 1 through 24 talks about, well, all of it really is the continual theme of this acrostic. Oh, how I love God's word. How I love the law, David would say. Now, of course, David didn't have all of this. But what he did have, he feasted on. And even when he loved God's word, still makes mistakes. It's a reminder that we're not looking for perfection but just perseverance. Keep going. Let me read just a few verses of what, of what David writes here. Starting, we're just going to do the first, uh, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet here. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him. With all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, 
I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. David had such a love for the word of God. And of course, a love for the God of the word. When you know the author, it changes everything. I could give you the letter that Shelley wrote me and some, to a stranger that doesn't know her or I. It will mean nothing. But when you begin to get to know the author, it changes everything. You begin to think about them, wondering, what could this mean? What could that mean? There's an affection, a fondness, an intimacy that comes with knowing that person. And when you know the God of the word, you will feast on the word of God. Every chance you can get. When we study the Bible, we study the Bible because it's essential for three reasons. For spiritual growth. If you do not study God's word, and I don't mean just casually pick it up, do a brief little 90 second daily bread. Good place to start, not a place to stay. You, if you say, well, I'm just growing leaps and bounds. I'm going to push back on you and say, well, are, are you studying God's word? And if you say no, you might be deceived. Bible study is essential for spiritual growth. We just are not going to grow spiritually if we don't feast on the spiritual food. Bible study is essential for spiritual maturity. The more that you begin to grow, the more mature you become. You begin this picture of, of being a, a baby in Christ and you're drinking milk. Then you move from drinking milk and you move into real sustenance. You cannot just keep drinking the milk. You have to keep moving forward. Everybody here has done it. Everybody has moved beyond that formula or nursing to something of more sustenance because your body demanded it. Your doctor said it is now time to try new things. You were excited as a parent to say, hey, let's give them something new. Grandparents giving them something they shouldn't. You know, all those fun things. And then you actually feasting on and growing in, in God's word is when you become more mature. And finally, Bible study is essential for spiritual effectiveness. You try to be effective, but oftentimes we take God's word and we want to throw it at people. That's not effective. You try to Bible thump people. The truth is, start here. And then when the Lord prompts you to have conversations with believers, then you sit down and you have those conversations. And when justice needs to be sought with God's word, you go and you seek that justice. That's how you become effective. What is personal Bible study? Well, it's methodical. Certain steps in a certain order for a certain result. If you know anything about baking or cooking, there are typically, there's typically certain steps in a certain order to get a certain result. We'll make homemade pizza, and I typically will put the dough together. If you know anything about the fast-rising yeast, the fact that it's a living organism, isn't that crazy? And then you put it in too hot a water, you can kill it. So I need the right water. It needs to dissolve five minutes before I put in the flour. Then you can put in the oil, and then you get it all mixed up in your mixer. If you don't do it a certain way at a certain temperature, it does not rise the way it's supposed to. Then you go, huh, something's wrong. I put everything together. Have you ever done a recipe and you go back and go, Something's not right. Same thing's true with your spiritual life. You're going through your day, your week, and you're going, something seems off. When was the last time you spent time with the Lord? When was the last time you sat beneath him and just said, hey, you want to talk to me? I'm just going to listen. Or just go, 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 go. Certain steps in certain order to get a certain result. And so over the next three weeks, and then we'll practice it all together on the fourth week, the final week, we're going to look at these three steps. Practice observation. What do I see? It's very simple. You open the Bible and you go, what do I see? 
observe. Some people are very observant and some are not. Some walk in here and see a stained glass window and they go, oh, wow, that's the most beautiful thing ever. And some people go, when we put that in? Somewhere around 1925, about a minute ago. They're like, oh, really? I never noticed that there. Some people are observant and some are not. Just, what do I see? If you do that in a room you've never been in, you'd be surprised on what you take in. I, I try not to do it. Because I stand there trying to talk to someone and I'm doing this. Oh my word, to focus my thoughts sometimes. And I'm looking all over the place. What do I see? So first, what do you see? Second is interpretation. What does it mean? If you don't have good observation, your interpretation will be awful. It'll be inaccurate. You have to make sure that you have good, solid observation. And we will talk through that over the next couple of weeks. Observation, interpretation. What does it mean? And finally, application. How does it work? All too often, people want to jump right to application. Okay, I'm going to read a verse. How does it apply? No, 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 no. Time out. What, do you observe? what are you seeing? What does it mean? Now, how does it work? Now, how does it apply to your life? And we need to make sure we do it in that order, those steps to get a very specific result. The tools of Bible study... If you're going to study the Bible, you should probably have a... See, you already are on top of this. You already know. You need to have a Bible if you're going to study a Bible. And I, it's overwhelming. It can be a lot to take in. There's so many different types. There's study Bibles for men and women. There's reference Bibles. Uh, Bibles with margins. Bibles without margins. Hardback. Leatherback. There's uh, one with references in it, Schofield Study Bible, Ryrie Study Bible, the Life Application Bible, the NIV Study Bible. You're like, where do I even begin? I'm going to recommend for now, if this is your first jump into it, pick something you'll read. Can we start there? Pick something you'll read. I like to learn through the New Living Translation. Pastor Craig likes to learn through the English Standard Version. We like our uh, certain things, but I don't just read this. This one, this one translation. I like to read multiple. I'll even throw in the paraphrase of the message just to kind of see how they have reworded things. But I like to take it all in together and pray over it. So if you're going to study the Bible, you need to make sure you have a Bible. If you're not sure, send something to me and I'll let you know if, you know, if, if it seems good or not. But a life apl application Bible is a pretty solid one. It'll give you great insights along the way. Historical references as well. And on top of this, a, a Bible. Uh, this is the key here. you got to have a Bible. I'd also recommend a notebook. If you want to write down some notes, whether it's an electronic notebook, a notepad. Right, kids? Tell your mom, I really want to study the Bible. I need a new Google notebook or something. I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. Kind of. So get a notebook. So you can write down some stuff. But if you get a Bible with big margins, I know, Craig, like, you like your big margin Bibles, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big margins in there where you can write, like, you have a lot of space to write notes. And there's a lot of things that you can put in there. You can write when you heard a sermon, you know, some thoughts on it, then you can go back and review it. I like to put dates next to things when, it's, uh, when I hear of it. I'm like, oh, man, I was studying that back then. That's kind of cool. It's just a reminder of how far we've come in different ways. So our big idea is going to be the same this whole time. You can prepare healthy, spiritual meals to enjoy and share with others. You can. You can. You can prepare healthy, spiritual meals on your own to enjoy and share with others. So what would be a next step? Well, I kind of already said it. Get a Bible. Get a notebook of some sort. Get a, there's Bible highlighters, specifically for Bible pages. I have a handful of those. Um, I use those a lot. Uh, Shelly has a bunch of highlighters that colors mean different things. It's the most beautiful Bible I've ever seen. It's got all kinds of colors. You just get through 2 second, second Samuel. Yeah, just went through 2 Samuel. By the time she's done, this thing's going to be just glowing. right? So get a highlighter. Get the right pens or pencils to be able to write in there so it doesn't you know, bleed through and messes up the other pages. I know this is for real, right? Sounds like a lot of work. It, it, anything worth doing is worth doing right. So if you're going to jump in, jump in with everything you've got, which means, here's a big next step, make every effort 
to learn alongside your church family over these next four weeks now so that you can know how to study God's word well. Be here, be together, and even ask each other, how's it coming? So this week, get the tools you need so we can jump into next week's observation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Wow, thank you for your written word that we can go back to at any time. That we can read through, we can pray through, we can learn from. Man, we can even be corrected by. God, thank you so much that we can learn it in so many languages even. Thank you that we get it in our language that we predominantly speak here, English. Thank you that we can go through and we can allow your Holy Spirit to teach us train us and interpret all that we need. So God, as we go through this week, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to be able to gather the tools we need so we can learn more about what it means to observe, what it means to interpret, what it means to apply your word in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you please stand, receive the blessing of the Lord as we head out here today? You go stretch it out. <laughs> you guys crack me. I always tell when I go a little bit longer than usual. It, all right, here we go. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Say with me, go and be the church.